Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage DAV Past National Commander Dennis Joyner. Named by President Reagan as the Handicapped American of the Year in 1983, Dennis was appointed Board President of the Disabled Veterans Life Memorial Foundation in 2015. Ten years ago today, while speaking about the importance of the memorial during its dedication ceremony, Dennis said, although I've been blessed with many achievements in life, the achievement I am most proud of is this memorial, a memorial that gives me and the many thousands of other disabled veterans like me a sense of contentment, knowing that what we gave, what our families gave, and what we continue to give will be forever remembered here in our nation's capital. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Joyner. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure and a blessing to welcome you to the 10th anniversary of the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial. To start this ceremony, I'd like to ask the DAV Department of the District of Columbia to honor us by presenting the flag of our great nation. If you'd please rise. Present colors. Please welcome to the stage to sing the national anthem, Staff Sergeant Leslie Ostransky of the United States Army Chorus and, uh, and Ensemble within the United States Army Band, better known as Pershing's Own. The band was formed in 1922 by the order of General John J. Pershing and has entertained audiences around the world ever since. A native of Frederick, Maryland, Sergeant Ostransky has been a member of the band since 2023. She joined the Army in 2018 and was previously a member of the U.S. Army Field Band's Soldiers Chorus. Sergeant Ostransky. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting. Incredible, Sergeant Ostransky. Thank you. Please remain standing and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Sergeant Ostransky and the DAV Department of the District Columbia for helping us kick off this anniversary right. Be seated. While we mark a decade since this great memorial was dedicated, it's been more than 25 years since the effort to establish the memorial began. The realization of the memorial would not have been possible without many of the individuals and organizations here today. Let's please, please give them a warm round of applause. Thank you. And it certainly would not have been possible without the leadership and concerted effort of one veteran in particular. Unfortunately, he can't be here today, which is just as well, because he'd probably hate me for singling him out. But please, let's offer Art Wilson a round of applause. He can hear from Florida. Thank you, Art. Where he has important family obligations. A decade ago, on this very uh, grounds, I wheeled to the lectern and I bared my soul. I shared how I had barely served a month in Vietnam before I was blown up in the Mekong Delta. I admitted for the first time publicly that I had screamed to my fellow soldiers the words, let me die. I still remember those words and those moments vividly. In marking this 10-year anniversary, I realize it's been 55 years since my life was forever changed. I've been asked over the past decade what the memorial means to me. Undeniably, it's a place of reflection and healing. Our memorial is a physical reminder of the human cost of war, a tribute to the sacrifices of past, present, and future generations. At the same time, it's a testament to our resilience and our resolve for justice. Justice for our brothers and sisters. Justice for our families. Justice for our survivors. It is a place of us, by us, and for us. That said, this ceremony would be a hollow and somber affair if we stood here to report that since this memorial was dedicated, the plight of our nation's disabled veterans and families was unchanged. Fortunately, that's not the case. Those who supported this memorial's establishment have continued and in many respects advanced the great cause it represents. In the last decade, we've made profound and sustained progress in ensuring promises are kept to our nation's defenders. The historic wave of veterans returning from a war to a nation ill-prepared to welcome them home is less likely to repeat itself now than at any previous time. We are stronger. We can clearly see progress in our combined efforts to help veterans confront the invisible injuries of war. We see it in the innovative ways that the DAV supports veterans achieving their fulfill fullest potential through employment and entrepreneurship. We see it in the work that our members did to get the PACT Act signed into law. It's the largest and most sweeping toxic exposure policy success ever, and a clear victory on our path to achieving a full measure of justice for our brothers and sisters. And we see in the relentless, bold advocacy work that we do on Capitol Hill, just look to the recently issued Ending the Weight Report which was produced by the DAV in partnership with the Military Officers Association. It underlines the problem of veterans waiting, on average, 
more than 34 years after a toxic exposure before our government presumes a condition was connected to their service. But we don't just mention the problem. We provide a clear, actionable path to expedite justice. Our work to secure justice for all veterans, including women veterans, the least represented, but the fastest growing veteran population. In this past decade, DAV has released not one, not two, but three landmark reports on women veterans. The latest one released this year is Women Veterans, The Journey to Mental Health. Through all this and so much more, we can see there's reason for hope. The progress that we've made in the last 3,650 days is significant, and it's meaningful. That progress extends to the people who share in the sacrifices veterans have made for our country. Disabled veterans don't go it alone. Though they are not etched here in the glass, we have our families at home and our military families who form a network of support and coalesce around us. Few people, few people can ever understand what it's like living life with a disabled veteran. Today, I'm going to share some of my family's experiences, knowing they represent the journeys of millions of others who were forever changed in wartime service. Ed Reynolds was the first person to reach me after I tripped the landmine in the Mekong Delta. When I asked him to let me die, he slapped me across the face, and he told me that I had a family and a child waiting for me to return. I think he was about to slap me again to keep me from going into shock or falling completely into despair. But then, in lieu of another blow, I told him I wanted to live. It was at that moment I knew God had a plan for me. And, oh, and though my new fight was to reimagine what life could be like, look like following the devastation of war, my fellow soldiers continued to face the enemy and, risk, and the risk that they, they too could be separated from their limbs or even their life. My lieutenant, Dave Crittenden, had the unenviable task of bringing the soldiers in the unit together and maintaining morale among my brothers at firebase danger. My medic, Dewey Doc Hayes, risked his life to help save mine. Both have struggled with the thought that it may have been better to make me comfortable and allow me to die. Looking back more than half a century, I wonder if, in a way, the trauma that they've endured as they saved my life wasn't more disabling to them than the physical injuries that I suffered. But wounds can heal more fully when we have each other to lean on. These men are like brothers to me, only closer in many, many ways. I was reunited with Ed Reynolds the first time in 1983 after being elected National Commander of the DAV. And when we see one another today, we pick up right where we left off, just knowing I can reach out to him or any of my brothers as a solace when I'm feeling low. Then there's my family, who call on me as a brother, a husband, and a father. My son Dennis was a month old when I was drafted, and seven months old when I was injured. 
He doesn't remember toddling through the Valley Forge Armory Hospital Visitor Lounge. And my son Paul, he was born 13 months after my first Alive Day. Though I still struggle with my performance as a parent to my children as a triple amputee, I'm blessed that my kids showed incredible resilience in the face of a vicarious trauma. I'm as grateful for the care and love that they supplied me as they can ever be with the support I provided them as a father. I cherish the memories of being involved in the boys' sports, scouts, and other childhood activities. They let me pitch when they played baseball. When they played football, they let me be the full-time quarterback, pushing me up and down the field after each play. I see them shaking their heads. <laughs> My daughter, Kristen, came along 20 years later. We wanted her to have the best possible childhood, and I had a lot more time to devote to her development. But in her first year of school, we got a call that she was inconsolable. Her classmates were making fun of her because her daddy didn't have legs. In sixth grade, she wrote an essay about our lives that was so good, she was asked to read it during her Veterans Day program. In it, she wrote that one thing she'd learned from my injury was that no matter how badly you're hurt, it's still important to help others. She talked about my involvement in her activities but there was one thing, she didn't show as much enthusiasm for my sports skills as I got from my boys. When it came to shooting basketball, she wrote and told the whole school, most of the time he makes the net. That's not really that funny, it was 20 years later, you know. She concluded the essay with, if you listen to him, his stories about Vietnam it can be very interesting. But the most important lesson he taught me is that it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. All that matters is what kind of a person you are on the inside. My wife Donna came into my life at a time when I was pretty sure that no woman would ever love someone so broken physically and mentally. She's been my rock, the love of my life, and my best friend. I was extremely proud when she advocated before the caregiver program and our experiences. Yes, I am his caregiver, she told them. But most importantly, I am his wife. And I'll always be there beside him helping him, whether you consider me a caregiver or not. In honor of the many, many others who shared in the sacrifices of our nation's heroes, I'd like to invite the members of my family, those who served in the military, and those who served after, in your own special way, to join me here on the stage. My daughter, Kristen, my son, Paul. Just come over this way. Thanks. My son, Dennis. Thank you. Love you guys. My lieutenant. Dave Crittenden. You're the best. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thanks for being here. The man, my sergeant, that saved my life that day, Ed Reynolds.
love you, brother. <laughs> I skipped that. <laughs> that was in there. <laughs> and my wife, Donna. Life has been great. But sometimes life isn't That's easy, good. and she's always been there. Thank you. Thank you all so much. This wind is really difficult. Thank you all. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your devotion. Thank you for giving me the greatest life imaginable and for the sacrifices that you have made to make me feel whole. To see the ongoing and expanding relevance of this memorial, we don't have to look any further than the victories that we've notched to date, including expansion of caregiver benefits, DAB's caregiver initiative, the support initiative, and pending efforts like the Elizabeth Dole Home Care Act. Those victories also make it evident that today we're above sacred ground. Ongoing generations will benefit from the memorial that we've established. And I thank all of you who've made a tribute to the heroes and advocates it represents. As we gather here and we look over at the capital of, those, of the greatest, freest country in the world, we know more than anyone that freedom isn't free. We who have paid a price for it, we're honored to do so. And this place, this memorial of us, by us, and for us, will forever honor the sacrifices made by all disabled veterans and their families. Thank you, and again, on behalf of all veterans disabled in service to our great nation, thank you for being here today. Thank all of you. Thank you. I'm now excited to introduce our special guest this afternoon, Theater of War Productions. I would like to invite artistic director Brian Dorries to share more about today's reading of Sophocles Philoctetes. Chorus members, please come to the stage at this time. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. Uh, you're a very hard act to follow, but I'm grateful for everything you just shared. And Thank you so much. What a beautiful setup for what we're about to do. My name is Brian Dorries. I'm the Artistic Director of Theater of War Productions. We're a social impact theater company that's based in New York City. We've been around for 18 years, and we are absolutely honored to be bringing our project, Theater of War, to the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial Commemorative 10-Year Anniversary. It's a special honor for us to be able to present the project that started Theater of War over 18 years ago, Theater of War Philoctetes, not just with three of our actors, uh, from New York City and Los Angeles, but also with 10 veterans from the DAV community playing the role of the chorus in the Greek tragedy, the Greek play we're going to perform today. Theater of War got its start 18 years ago with a wild hunch that ancient Greek war plays that were written by a general named Sophocles and performed uh, in their own time uh, in Athens for as many as 18,000 citizen soldiers in a century in which those citizen soldiers saw nearly 80 years of war, that these ancient war plays would have something powerful to say to veterans and their families today. Our first performance of that wild hunch was in front of 400 Marines in San Diego. Uh, we had no idea what would happen. We performed six scenes from two ancient Greek war plays and scheduled a conversation with those 400 Marines and their spouses. And uh, you could have heard a pin drop during the performance. I didn't know how it was going. I didn't really know one, anyone in the military when we got started with this project, Active Duty. I just hoped we could be of service in some way. But when the conversation started that night, and Marines of all ranks 
and all ages and all walks of life. And their spouses began quoting lines from memory from this ancient Greek war play as if they'd known it their entire lives and then relating it to their stories, their experiences, the, most, the timeless experiences that transcend uh, generations. We knew we'd stumbled across an ancient military technology that was developed to do the very thing we're gonna try to do today, which is to commemorate, to memorialize, to celebrate, to communalize the experience of war and the reality of war. And so um, that conversation uh, in San Diego that was scheduled for 45 minutes lasted three and a half hours and had to be cut off at midnight. And I promise we won't do that in the hot sun this afternoon. But this is the way the ancient Greeks did it, by the way, out in the hot sun, so we're grateful for you. The other thing I want to mention is that the Greeks, every spring, would hold a theater festival that was uh, inextricably an exercise in democracy. It was a religious exercise, it was spiritual, it was civic, it was rhetorical, it was legal, and it was part of the military as well. The theater festival began with a procession in which the generals led in a contingent of the military officers into the space, and they sat in special thrones in the front. And the very festival itself where this play was performed in 409 BC began with a ritual memorializing and commemorating the recently war dead uh, when their orphan children came out and received the armor of their fallen fathers. So there's no one in the audience who would have missed the significance of what this play is about. And what we learned very early days is we thought we were clever performing this ancient play for military audiences. What we didn't know is that we actually needed military audiences to explain to us what this ancient story was about. So today's uh, format is a little different. We're, we have some constraints on time. So what we're going to do is we're going to perform uh, a majority of this ancient play called Philoctetes. And as soon as we're done with the performance, the actors who I'm going to introduce in just a second, they're going to come sit in the audience. And then I'm going to lead a discussion with the 10 chorus members, the 10 uh, DAV chorus members, about what resonated with them in the performance of this ancient text, what touched them across time in spite of the distance of culture and time. And we'll get down to it for a few minutes. We'll squeeze what we can uh, and, uh, in this beautiful and sacred space. And hopefully, we'll continue talking amongst you uh, out in this beautiful space before the event comes to a close. So the ancient Greek culture that produced this theater, this ancient, highly militarized democracy, also used the theater as a memorial. And so it could be no more fitting place, as far as I'm concerned, for us to be memorializing American veterans and also honoring their sacrifices than here in this space today. I know it took a long time to build this memorial. It wasn't a small amount of struggle to make it happen. And this play is also about the challenges and struggles of getting that ancient militarized democracy to acknowledge and see and not look away from the consequences of their foreign policy decisions and the sacrifices that their veterans have made. And so I won't steal anything more, but before we get started, I just want to quickly introduce the actors in the chorus who are going to perform for you today. Uh, on stage to your far left is the actor David Sturthern. You may know him from Good Night and Good Luck and Lincoln, and to his right is Atu Blankson Wood, who recently played Hamlet in Shakespeare in the Park and has been in films like and series like When They See Us and uh, Detroit. And to his right is Chad Coleman, who you may know from The Wire and The Walking Dead. And these three actors are part of a much larger company of more than 250 actors who, when they get the call, do you want to get up at the crack of dawn, fly coach, stay in a Holiday Inn, and perform ancient Greek tragedy for a thousand Marines or soldiers who've been voluntold to watch it and then talk about their feelings, they jump. Because they believe, like I do, there's nothing more important we could be trying to do with our craft as citizens than what we're going to try to do here in this space with you right now. So I'm grateful to them for saying yes every time and turning down offers to be with us. And then on the stage, I don't want to mess up everyone's last names, so forgive me for pulling my phone out. I know everyone's first names. But um, from the far right is Nancy Espinoza. You probably, many of you know who these individuals are. Dan Clare, Kevin Miller, Justin Hart, Naomi Mathis, Anthony Swafford, Ryan Burgess, David Riley, Cynthia Madison, and Dan Contreras. We're so grateful to these 10 veterans for saying yes. And by the way, who else does this? This is the first time I've ever heard of this myself, of an organization this innovative to hold an event where they're commemorating a memorial with a living performance of an ancient story and then exploring how it relates to the present moment. 
with the backdrop of Washington, D.C. all around us. So I just want to thank DAV with a huge round of applause for being that forward-thinking organization that would take take a risk on us. Also, just briefly, this is not our first collaboration with DAV. We've done several performances, some of which are online, including a performance of Walt Whitman's poem, The Wound Dresser, with a combination of veterans and actors, uh, a, a Vietnam War memorial by an amazing friend of mine named John Musgrave called The Education of Corporal John Musgrave. He was a subject in Ken Burns' The Vietnam War series. We performed sections of that and had a conversation. We've done theater of war with Willem Dafoe and veterans from DAV, but that was all online, and because of the pandemic, this is our first event together with you all as a community, and it's such a shot in the arm. So here's all you need to know about Philoctetes. Um, Sophocles' Philoctetes uh, was written in the year 409, but it takes place in the last year of the Trojan War. Um, Nine years prior, when the Greeks decide to war wage war against the Trojans, they launch a thousand ships. And there was one combat veteran who knew the way to Troy. His name was Philoctetes, and he had been there on previous deployments, and he led the Greek armada to Troy. But halfway to Troy, they met unfavorable seas and rocky winds, and they needed to find a place for the winds to shift and to wait off the storms. And Philoctetes knew of a, an abandoned and deserted island called Lemnos, where he, he knew they could seek shelter. And so Philoctetes led the Greeks to Lemnos. And as Philoctetes was the first to step off his ship, he was the first to step into the, uh, onto the island and into the temple of a river goddess named Crise. And as he stepped into the sacred temple of the river goddess, the sacred snake of the river goddess slithered up and bit Philoctetes on the back of his foot. And it was a poisonous snake and venom coursed through his veins, and he fell to the ground, calling out for mercy and crying with abandon, but no mercy came. And for three agonizing days, Philoctetes wailed and cried and screamed, uh, asking for an end to his seemingly endless pain. And the sounds of his scream and the stench of his wound, which became infected and began to separate, wafted out of the temple and into the camps where all the men were waiting to go to war. They'd waited their entire lives for this moment. Uh, and now they had a service-disabled veteran on their hands, and they hadn't even gotten to the battlefront yet. And they had no medicine to help his pain, and his screams were destroying their morale and their cohesion. Fast forward three days, the Greeks uh, see that the winds shift back in their direction. They get ready to sail, and the generals decide to hold a a conference with uh, Odysseus, who in our version is like the head of Greek intelligence, the head of Greek CIA. They bring in Odysseus, head of intelligence, and they say to him, what do we do? We have this service disabled veteran in our hands. He, we have no medicine to help him, and um, his screams are destroying our, our men's morale and their cohesion. And Odysseus says this, I know we were taught to never leave a man behind. I know that that was our core value from basic training on but that's what we should do in service of the larger mission. And so Philoctetes watches his own men, his own community, his friends and brothers leave him for dead as they sail away to Troy and abandon him on the island of Lemnos. And for nine long years, Philoctetes lives in a cave like an animal scrounging for herbs to dull the pain of his wound, hunting down other animals with a bow and arrow, a magical and invincible weapon that he was given by the god Heracles. And were it not for this magical weapon, the arrows never missed their targets. He surely would have died, but believing he was suffering for a reason, believing that he would one day be vindicated and ultimately taken home, Philoctetes willed himself to survive these nine long years, waiting for that day to come. Fast forward nine years, and on the battlefront of the Trojan War, the Greeks have lost many of their greatest warriors and leaders. Achilles, the greatest of all Greek warriors, has died. Ajax, the strongest of all the Greek warriors, has died. The Greeks just want to go home. They want to be victorious, but there's no end in sight, and they start to get desperate. So the generals hold another executive session. They bring in Odysseus, head of intelligence. They say, what do we do? And Odysseus says... I think we should go into Troy under cover of night and capture the Trojan, Trojan seer, the prophet named Hellenus, and we should torture him until he tells us the future of how the war will be won. And that's what the Greeks do. They go into Troy under cover of night. They find this prophet, the seer named Hellenus. They torture him. And what does Hellenus say? Until the Greeks go back to the island of Lemnos and get Philoctetes and his weapon off the island and bring them to Troy, Troy will never fall. 
So the play begins with a unit that's dispatched by the general officers. They give Odysseus, the man who abandoned Philoctetes on the island of Lemnos, the onerous task of going back and getting him off the island. Being no fool, Odysseus takes along a young man to serve as a decoy. And this young man is named Neoptolemus. And Neoptolemus means, in Greek, new to war. And Neoptolemus is the son of the great Achilles, who recently died in battle. And he was a child for most of the war, but he's just come to Troy to make a name for himself in his father's great shadow. So all you need to know about the first scene is simply this. For the last three days, Odysseus and Neoptolemus, the son of Achilles, have been traveling back from Troy to the island of Lemnos. And now, as this first scene begins, they are washing up on the beaches of, Phil of, of Lemnos with their men, searching for Philoctetes. Neoptolemus, here we are. The Isle of Limnos, a no man's land surrounded by the sea. It was here that I stranded the Malian, exposed him like an unwanted baby, pus draining from the sacred snake bite, gnawing at his foot. Just following orders, I can still hear the howling, the gnashing of teeth that kept us from pouring libations, the screams that pierce the stillness before the sacrifice. No more words. Now is not the time to talk. We must catch him before he catches us. And be a good boy. Go find a cave with two mouths, where in winter the sun shines at both ends, and during summer a cool breeze carries sleep. You might find a stream downhill, if it is still there. Do this quietly. Report to me quickly. I want to know whether his home is the same as I left it, or some other place. Then I will tell you the rest of the story. That won't take long, Lord Odysseus. I can see the cave. It looks just like you said it would. Up there or down over here? I can't see well from where I'm standing. Over here. No sound of footstep. I hear nothing. Be careful. He might be asleep. There's a help hovel. It's empty. No man inside. Look for signs of life. A bed of matted leaves fit for a camper. What else? A makeshift cup uh, whittled from wood. A circle of stones for a fire. A poor man's treasure. It must be his. Uh, there's something else. Oh, rags caked with carrion. Drying discharge from an open sore. Clearly we found it. The place where he lives. He must be close. How far could a man walk on foot that is sick from the fury? He's hunting for food or searching for herbs to extinguish the fire of his ancient affliction. Send your man as a lookout to, to keep him from ambushing me. It's me he wants most, more than anyone else. Consider it done. Is there anything else? Just say the word. Prove your nobility, son of Achilles. Not only your body's nobility, Whatever strange things that are said here today, always remember you came here with me. Sir, yes, sir. What are your orders? Pull the wool over his eyes. Seduce him with your words. When he asks who you are, say, I am the son of Achilles. That much is true. No need to hide it. Then you should say you're sailing for home deserting the army that begged you to come in the first place, their only hope of taking Troy. But when you arrive and ask for the arms of Achilles, they said you were, you weren't worthy of such a birth. Write and dress Odysseus in your father's suit. Ad-lib insults, the more the better. Pull no punches, I'll be fine. Worry about the Greeks instead, for if we fail to steal the bow, you will never triumph over Troy. Only you can do this, not I, nor anyone else. Too young to swear the oath to Helen's father, you shipped out to sea alone, owing nothing to anyone. I cannot say the same. If he should see me through the sight of his bow, I'm already dead. And you will be next. A thief of invincible weapons must be clever. 
I know it's not your nature, son, to manipulate and scheme, but the taste of victory will cut the bitterness of shame. A few hours in exchange for a lifetime. Son of Laertes, it hurts me to hear of things I hate to do. It's just not in me to lie. Not in my blood, not in my father's blood. The man only has one good foot. Surely we can take him together. They sent me to help you, sir, but I would rather die honestly than win deceitfully. Your father was noble, son. When I was your age, I said all kinds of things, but always backed my words with fists. That was long ago. Now I know the strongest muscle is the tongue. Are you still asking me to lie? I'm ordering you to catch Philoctetes in a trap. Why should I trap him if I can persuade him? He won't be persuaded or forced to do anything. What's so special about his strength? It's the arrows. They never miss. Then how do I get near him? I already told you, a trap. But aren't you ashamed of lying? Not if the lie is our only salvation. How will I keep a straight face saying these terrible things? Remember what you stand to gain. But what do I gain if he comes to Troy? The bow will bring the city to its knees. Am I the one who will do this? Without you and the bow, Troy will never fall. In that case, it might be worth it. Sure it is. You'd walk away with two prizes. Which ones? If I knew, I might act. Well, people would say you were clever and brave. Let the river run its course. I'll do it, shamelessly. Do you remember your orders? Of course, now that I've agreed. Stay here and wait for him. I'll look for the lookout, so as not to be seen, and send him back to the ship. If it takes too long, he'll return in the guise of a captain. Beneath his words, whatever he may say will lie a message for you. May Hermes the trickster guide us both, and Athena, victory goddess, who always bails me out. We are strangers. Wandering without a map. Around this paranoid island. Wondering what to say. And what to stifle. When confronted by a suspicious man. What are your orders? We trust your judgment. Zeus gave you the gift. Hold it in your hand. Scatter out bravely into the underbrush. Scout the location where he sleeps. Stand ready to help when the lame warrior returns. I'll give you a sign. Yes, but where is the camp? How far away? He's traveling from? What if he? All of a sudden. Ambushes us from behind. Over there, two openings, one home where he rests against the rocks. But where is the wretched man now? now? Hunger drags his wounded foot not far away from here. He's set to spend his days hunting with flying shafts, consumed by pain and no one here to ease his suffering. Poor man. I pity him. Isolated and alone. No one to nurse him. He talks to himself. Sharing his body. With a brutal disease. How does he do it? The gods work well. When men suffer endlessly and die. This noble man. Inferior to none of the first families. Claims nothing from his species. But lives among the spotted deer. And shaggy goats. With his incurable affliction. Starving for human contact. Crying out to Echo. Echo crying out to him. I'm not surprised. If I know the gods, this divine pain from savage Crisse, nymph of Lemnos, stranded him here for a reason. Until the time when Troy would fall, his bow and arrows arrested on this island. Silence! What is it? A noise. The kind a man makes. Clenching his teeth in agony. Over here! Now over there! It sounds just like an animal. Crawling on all fours. There, I hear it again. A body in pain. A man in great distress. Reduced to howling. But listen. Tell me. He's not far away. Instead of playing the pipe, as most shepherds do, he trips and screams, making music with his moans. Maybe he saw ca- sight of the ship. Anchored in the secret cove. I'm frightened of his wailing. Strangers, uh, oh, tell me uh, who you are, uh, sailing ships to a place without harbors or men. To which country do you belong? Your clothes appear Greek, closest to my heart, but let me hear your voices so I can be sure. <laughs> Don't go. I know how it looks, this savage state of nature. I am wretched, afflicted, and alone, with no one to talk to, so I have no friends. Please, if you want to be my friends, say something, anything, but never leave a man hanging. Let me be the first to tell you, stranger, we are Greeks since that is what you wish to know. Oh, you have no idea how sweet your voice sounds to a man who hasn't spoken or been spoken to in so long. But what brings you here? 
On which wind did you sail? Answer, so I might know you. I was born on Skiros. Now I'm sailing home. Some people call me son of Achilles. Others, Neoptolemus. That is all you need to know. Son of Achilles, dearest of friends, I, I knew your grandfather, Lycomedes. He was so proud when you were born. What adventures led you to this place? From which land did you last set sail? I, I'm sailing away from Troy. What? I don't understand. You are far too young for the first wave of ships. Were you there? Son, you don't know who you're looking at. How can I recognize the face of someone I've never seen? Uh, perhaps you've heard my name or the myth of my misfortunes. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I am wretched, hated by the gods if men don't know my story. Those who discarded my weak body now laugh silently while the disease grows stronger each day. My son, I am Philoctetes, the keeper of Heracles' bow, whom the generals and Odysseus abandoned. Suffering from a snake bite, they left me here to die in tattered rags, sleeping in a jagged cave, starving without much food to eat. I only wish the same for them. Imagine my surprise, son, when I awoke, the tears I shed, the sound of my sadness. All of the ships in the fleet had vanished. Alone with my infection, oh, I only knew pain. Time demanded that I scavenge for food with this sacred bow, which saved my life. I would crawl through deep mud on stiff knees, and scraping my rotten foot against rocks. When water was scarce, I survived by collecting ice. I spent cold winters without fire, but rubbing stones together for their spark, I, I saved myself from certain death. So, uh, you see, I, I, I have everything I need here in this cave, except a cure for my endless affliction. Listen, son, and I will tell you about this island. Sailors know not to approach its rough shores. It is not a destination for men who know its dangers. Occasionally, those who chance to end up here take pity on me with food and clothing, but never, never when I have asked to offer to take me home. Nine miserable years. Son, this is what they have done to me, <laughs> the Greek generals and Odysseus. I only pray that the Olympian gods visit them with proportionate suffering. I pity you, son of Poas. And I know what you mean about Odysseus and the sons of Atreus. They are evil men. Well, what have they done to you? If I could kill them all, I would, so that, that might, they might know that Skiros to be my mother of the most boldest men. Oh, well said, my boy. What is the source of your great hatred? I'll be honest with you, sir. As much as it hurts to feel the shame to speak of it, what happened when I sailed to Troy after my father's death? The son of Peleus is dead? His life, extinguished by no man, mowed down by Apollo's arrow. A noble way to die, God and man, both. Both so noble. But I, I'm sorry. I, I want to hear more about your troubles, but first I must swallow this feeling of remorse. There is already enough sadness in your life, poor man, for you to shoulder another man's grief. I suppose you're right. Uh, where were we? Uh, yes, uh, well, what did they do to you? Odysseus came to me unexpectedly one day on a beautiful ship, saying sweet words such as fate, destiny, divine justice, necessity, an oracle had foretold after my father's death that I alone would take the Trojan Towers. I alone would do this. We sailed straight away. I wanted to see his body before they put it in the ground. I longed to look at his face, and the promise stayed with me, singing softly in my ears. I would be the one to end the war. Two days later, we landed on the beaches of Sigeum, where I was surrounded by soldiers swearing they saw him, my father, Achilles standing there before him, still alive. Sadly, they were mistaken. I wept over his lifeless body. Naturally, I went to the generals and asked for what was mine. I can still hear their filthy words. Son of Achilles, feel free to take whatever you like, anything at all, except the armor. They now belong to Odysseus, son of Laertes. Oh. Tears burst from my eyes. My heart filled with rage. How dare you give my weapons to another man? Uh, 
and Odysseus was standing nearby. He turned to me and said, yes, boy, they were given to me for a reason. I was there. I saved them. I saved him. I savagely attacked him with every insult I knew and seemed to strike a nerve when filled with rage, he said, we were there. You were not where you were supposed to be. Need I say more? You will never return to Skiros with these arms. I sailed home empty-handed, robbed of what was rightfully mine by the sons of Atreus and Odysseus. And so anyone who hates them is dear to me. Mountain goddess. Rhea! Mother Earth. Sibylle. Womb of God. Called out to you. When they stripped you. Of his father's arms. Strangers, I, I understand your pain. As you crossed the ocean, it only brought us closer. It is my pain now, for I know the actions of evil men. Did Ajax stand by and let it happen? I find that very hard to believe. He was no longer among the living. Oh, is he also among the dead? He no longer sees the light. Only the good men die, while Odysseus and the sons of Atreus should, but never will. They pin medals on their chests and command the Argive army. But what about my old friend Nestor? Surely he would have tried to stop them. After losing his son Antilochus, he also lost his will to live. Oh, where can one look when they are dead and Odysseus lives? He is a slippery man, but one day he will slip. What about Patroclus, your, your father's dear friend? Dead. How do you make sense of the gods? They somehow take pleasure in turning the worst men away from Hades. Nobility, righteousness, valor, all meaningless words. I try not to think about it. In the future, I will gaze at Troy from my distant island with weary eyes. The cowards. Rocky Skiros will be enough for me. My home. My refuge from memory. Yes. And so, we must return to the ship. So long, son of Poeus. Goodbye. May the gods lift your affliction, relieve your relentless suffering. Let's go, while the wind remains. What, are you leaving already? Uh, We have to be ready if we're going to sail. Uh, uh, Then, uh, on my knees, I beg you, son, powerless and lame, do not leave me here alone in this condition. Take me with you. I, I know it is no small thing to ask, but I ask you all the same. Please, please, do the noble thing like, uh, like your father would have done. Deliver me to Oita, my home, and receive a great reward. It, it, it will only take a day. Put me wherever you like, the bow, the stern, the, the hull. I, I, I won't disturb your men. In the name of Zeus and God of beggars, do this for me. Please, say you will. Or, or, or take me to your home. It is not far from there to Trachus and the wide river Sperchius, where I may see my father, whom I fear no longer lives. I, I sent so many messages asking him to come, so either he is dead or the messengers hurried home, paying me no mind. I ask you again, save me. Take pity on me. Deliver me instead of the message. Pity this man. Who's endured countless problems. I would wish upon none of my friends. If you feel contempt for the general, sir. Then convert their evil into good. Take him where he wants to go. Upon your swift ship. Escape the gods' wrath. Those are kind words, but I wonder what you will say when you have heard enough of his cries. You will never hear us say anything else. Never. It would be embarrassing to seem less compassionate than my own men. If you agree... Then I say the ship will soon carry him home. I cannot refuse. May the gods grant us smooth smooth seas wherever we should sail. Oh, dearest friends, I never believed I'd see this day. But uh, uh, how might I prove my friendship to you? Come with me, son, and and after I have shown you my humble house, I'll give you a lesson in courage and survival. The first thing you learn is to embrace your pain. End of scene one. I have my mic, yeah. End of scene one. Uh, so here's all you need to know about scene two. Odysseus gets tired of waiting for Neoptolemus to accomplish the mission. So as he said he would do, he sends someone into the disguise of a captain to accelerate the scene. The captain cur- comes, he hurls <coughs> insults at Philoctetes and tells him that Odysseus is coming to hunt him down and take him to Troy by words or by force, whatever it will take. And so as this 
next scene begins. Philoctetes has just heard these insulting words spoken by and about his arch nemesis, Odysseus. Did he really think that he could charm me with sweet words? Ha! <laughs> and after all this time, uh, I would sooner befriend the thing I hate the most, the snake who bit my foot, turning me into an invalid, than listen to that evil man. Uh, but he will dare to say or do anything he pleases. At least we know he'll be here soon. My son, let's go, right away. Sail for open seas as far as we can sail from him. Forget sleep, we'll work now and sleep when we are safe. The wind is not right. It blows against the prow. We must wait until it shifts. Well, the weather's always good when sailing away from trouble. Yes, but the wind blows against their ships as well. well the weather is never bad for predators on the hunt. All right. Take what you need and we'll go. Uh, there are a few things, uh, uh, but not many, inside. W what could you possibly need that I don't have on my ship? A special herb that dulls the pain of this wound. By all means, get it. Anything else? Uh, some missing arrows uh, I might have scattered somewhere in the dirt. Is that the bow? The famous one? Yes. Yes, there is no other. It never leaves my hands. May I get a closer look at it? Could I hold it in my arms? Only you, son, deserve to do this, and anything else you should desire. I do desire to do it, but only if it is right. I'll let you decide if I'm worthy. Well, your words are full of reverence, and it is right for you alone, who gives me sunlight and the chance to see my homeland, Oeta, where at the feet of enemies father raised me to hold my head erect. You alone I trust to handle it, and then return it. Your actions, son, are as noble as this weapon, for it was won through kindness, and so you will be the only man to touch it with your fingers. I am not sorry to have met you, my newest friend. More valuable than any material possession is your humanity. Please, go inside. Uh, I, uh, I'll, uh, I'll ask you to join me as my illness demands you to stand along inside. There is a story. I heard it long ago. About the man Ixion, who crept upon Hera's bed. With evil intentions. Late one starless evening, Zeus tied him to a deadly wheel. And spun it hard. But there's no story I have ever heard. That matches the cruel and meaningless fate. Of this harmless man. Who's done nothing to deserve his pain. I sometimes wonder. How a man can listen. To the breaking waves. That pound the shores. Of this desolate island. What tears he must cry. But no one hears him moaning. As a snake bite slowly consumes his foot. There is no one to sing him a lullaby. Or heal his wounds with herbs if he should start shaking. Like a baby. But without a nursing mother. He crawls on all fours. The infection spreading up his spine. He did not plant seeds on sacred soil. But shot quick arrows with his bow. Hunting down wild game. Nine years without wine to drink? Poor man. And only stagnant pools of rain. And now he meets this man. Who promises to return him. To the nymphs of malice. And the river Sperchius. Where Heracles became a blazing god. And the flames atop Mount Oeda. Why are you silent? Why are you still? No. Uh, uh, what? oh, oh, no. What's wrong? Uh, uh, it, 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 it's nothing, son. Go, go ahead of me. Is it the pain of your affliction? No, no, it's passing. See, I, I, I already feel better. Ah, oh God, oh God. Why, why are you groaning? Oh, oh God. To I, the gods. I'm asking them to show some mercy. <laughs> Wait, what's the matter? Why won't you tell me? You seem like you're in trouble. I wanted to keep the pain to myself, son, but now it cuts straight through me. And do you understand? It cuts straight through me. I, I am being eaten alive. There is no I. It's only it. If you have a sword, chop. Here, take my foot. I want it off. I want it off. What is this pain that all of a sudden strikes so quickly? You know, my boy. No, what is it? Oh, how could you know? I can't bear to look at your condition. I know. I know it's terrible. It's, it's beyond words. But please, take pity on me. What do you want me to do? She comes when I have wandered too far. Eventually, if I am still, she, she goes, but do not abandon me. You wretched man, unlucky in all ways. Should I hold you in my arms? No, no, not that. The bow. Take it. Take it now, just as you asked, and keep it safe while I sleep until the pain also sleeps beside me. And if they come, son, 
I beg you, do not let them take it from you, or we both shall die. Do not be afraid, but hand it to me. Yes. I will care for it as if it were my own. No one will take it. There. It, it is in your hands now. Kiss it to avoid the curse that brought this trouble to me and the ones before. I pray to the gods grant us safe pas passage uh, wherever we are going. Oh, God, I have a sinking feeling, son. Your prayer will not be honored by the gods, for as we speak, blood is oozing from the sore. A dark red sign of evil things to come. Oh God, the pain swells underneath my foot. I, I feel it moving upward, tightening my chest. Oh God, I am wretched. Oh, don't go, please. Don't go. You understand. You know it's in a... <laughs> St stay with me. Oh, I wish they could feel this, Odysseus and the generals. Oh, death, 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 where are you? Why, after all years of calling, have you not appeared? Son, my noble son, take my body. Scorch it on a raging fire as I once burned the owner of the bow you now hold. Why the silence? Say something. Where have you gone, my son? Uh, your, your pain is painful to observe. No, it comes as quickly as it goes. Just be brave, son. I beg you to stay. Don't worry, we will stay. You will? Without a doubt. Oh, it is not right to make you swear an oath. It is not right to leave you here alone to die. Uh, hold your hand over your heart. I swear I will stay. Uh, look up. Where? Up there. Why are you staring skyward, your eyes and mind both reeling? Release me. Release me. Release you where? Just release me. I will not do it. If you touch me, you will kill me. You are, you are beginning to sound sane again. Go, oh, Earth. Swallow this body whole. Receive me just as I am. Or I can't stand it any longer. He seems to be falling asleep. Look. His head is nodding and cold sweat coats his skin. Let him rest as the dark blood drains from his wounded heel. Oh, sleep, unaware of her suffering or pain. Gentle sleep. Breathe bright white light upon his eyes. And heal his foot. Son! Be careful where you stand. Do not let your mind be clouded by sympathy. For this wretched man. Why are you hesitating? The moment is now. Choose correctly. And victory is yours. With one quick shot. Don't worry, he can't hear us. It is true we need the bow, but it is clear we need him, too. He is the one the god demands return to Troy on our swift ship. You should be ashamed to speak of actions you don't understand. Before the sick one wakes. Do the one thing you came to do. The wind is strong, my son. He sleeps like a shade. In permanent Hades night. Paralyzed from act, head to foot. Act now and speak later. Try to keep it down. His eyes are opening. It's all right. Sorry. Oh, never, my dear son, did I imagine waking to find you still here, <laughs> patiently waiting for the suffering to end. Oh, the light is so beautiful. After sleep, especially when friends are near, I see you have come to help. The generals waited less than a week before they had enough of me, but you are f from a noble family. You remained in spite of the smell and the loud groaning. But now that it seems she's left me for a while, give me a hand and help me stand up, and we'll walk together. The wind is right. We, we shouldn't wait any longer. I'm happy to see you breathing without pain. I was convinced you were dying in front of our eyes. At least, it seemed that way. But now, lift up your body, or if you prefer, my men will pick you up themselves. We are not afraid of heavy lifting. Uh, thank you, son. Yes, please, help me up as you have pledged to do, uh, by yourself, in case the awful smell repulses your men. Sharing the ship will be difficult enough. Now put your weight right here, and I will help you stand. Uh, don't worry, my body still remembers how. What am I supposed to do now? What was that? What, are, are you all right? I don't know what to say. What's the matter? Is this the way it has to be? Are you having second thoughts? 
Uh, I know my illness is repugnant. Everything is repugnant to a man who con contradicts his own nature. Yes, but you are acting like your father, showing compassion to a noble man. I will be called a traitor. Not for your actions. Your, your words scare me. What should I do? If I speak or remain silent, I am a criminal. It is clear this man intends to sail alone. Oh, that's not it. If I take you with me, you will suffer more. I don't understand. What are you trying to say? I'm done hiding. All will be revealed. You must sail to Troy and serve the sons of Atreus. What did you just say? There's more. Wait until you've heard before you jump to conclusions. What are you planning to do with me? Save you from imminent danger. Then you and I together will save the Greeks and conquer Troy. Are you serious? Necessity demands that I do this. Don't be angry when I tell you. What have you done? I should never have trusted you. Give me back that bow. I'm sorry, I can't do that. I swore an oath to answer those who are in command. Oh, you fire, you horror, you evil man. Look me in the eye and say it. You take my bow and you take my life. I beg you, son, in the name of your father and the gods, do not do it. Oh, God, he won't talk to me anymore. He won't even look in my direction. Oh, you harbors, you mountains, you wild beasts, hear what the son of Achilles has done. Holding up his hand, he, he solemnly swore to bring me home, but he shamefully stole the sacred bow of Heracles. He intends to parade me in front of the Greeks like some fallen warrior. He does not understand that I am nothing but a wisp of smoke, a human shell, a decomposing corpse. Son, you don't have to do this. Even now, it's not too late. I am lost in your silence, crawling to my cave, naked and exposed, stripped of my weapon. I, I most certainly will die. Once a hunter, but now hunted by the mountain beasts. Will you change your mind? Well, if not, then may you also die. What should we do? We await your orders. For some time now I have pitied this man. Oh, yes, pity me, son. I beg you, show me mercy. I should never have left Skiros. This is where the trouble began. You are not a liar like those evil men for whom you work. Do the right thing. Give me back the bow and sail home to Skiros. What do you think, men? I'll tell you what I think, son. Hand it over to me. Oh, who is that? It sounds like Odysseus. Well done. It is Odysseus whom you now see. Oh, it's over. I am destroyed. Sold to my worst enemy. Precisely. Give it back, boy. Quickly, give me. Let me have it. That will never happen. Even if he wished. You will accompany the bow willingly or by force. Uh, these men will bring me by force? If you don't agree to come. Uh, uh, sacred Lemnos, where Hephaestus keeps his fire, will protect me. I should mention that Zeus, ruler of the entire cosmos, decided these things long ago. I only carry out his orders. Only a hateful man hides behind the gods, turning them into liars. They speak the truth. It's time to go. And I say it is not. I beg to differ. You have no choice. Oh, I see. My noble father bore me into slavery. You are equal to the noble men with whom you'll soon take to Troy. Never! Even if I have to jump from this bridge. Easy there. Easy. Don't move, or I will bloody my skull on the rocks below. It's not for you to decide. Seize him! Let go of my arms. You used this boy as a smokescreen for your deception. Loyal to the army, he followed orders, and now look at him. His face says it all. He hates himself for what you made him do it, and it was you who taught him how to lie. You who ruined him forever. I mean, where are you taking me? I am nothing to you now. I might as well be dead. How will you make sacrifices in the stench of my sufferings? How will you ever set sail with my howling? Isn't that why you left me here to die in the first place? Ah, you will surely die for this, if the gods are just, and they are. Oh, why else would they send you back for me after nine long years? Oh, Lemnos, punish these men and cure me of this affliction. There are many things I could say. 
But I will limit myself to this. If you're looking for an honorable man, there is no one better than I. Ah. It is my nature to always win, except when it comes to you, to, to whom I now defer. Uh, let go of his hand. He will stay here. There's no need for him, now that we have the weapon. Terser and I know how to handle a bow. You are useless. Enjoy Lemnos. Let's go! Perhaps the generals will give me this weapon as a reward for taking Troy. Did you hear that? He plans to appear to the Argive army, waving my weapon. Do not speak to me. I'm already gone. Say something, son of Achilles, before you go. Come with me, son. That's a direct order. Stop looking at him, or you will taint our future. Strangers, don't you have feelings, too? Will you abandon me, too? This boy is our leader. We follow his command. Odysseus will reprimand me. But I order you to stay while the sailors prepare the ship. Pray the gods help this broken man recover, but stand ready to leave when you hear the call. You hollow caves burning and freezing within the seasons. I am destined to die without hope of food within your recesses. I call upon the birds of prey, the ones who were afraid. Come to me now that I am out of arrows. This is your fault. You made a choice. The god is not responsible. I am wretched. Bones fractured by the affliction, isolated, no friends to help me hunt without arrows. I am the sucker who was fooled by the great liar. Oh, I wish I could see him burning. This is your divine portion. Not the results of one man's lies. Direct your curses elsewhere. For we have stayed in friendship. Uh, somewhere on shore of the gray ocean, he sits laughing as he handles the weapon he stole from my hands. Dear Bo, I never meant for you to leave my sight. I have failed. The trickster will pervert your purposes and use you for evil ends. A man may state his case. But once he has spoken, he should not act spitefully. The man whom you hate was just following orders. He served the greater good. Oh, you birds of prey, you packs of wild-eyed creatures, no longer hunted from your homes by my quick hands, roam without fear across this island. Take your revenge on my sick body. Gorge your mouths with rotting flesh. I am ready to die. By the gods. If you respect goodwill or friendship. Listen to us. We are friends. It doesn't have to be this way. You can choose to save yourself. But why do you remind me of the ancient affliction? Why have you good men done this evil thing to me? What do you mean? You want to, to take me to Troy? Yes, that would be best. Ah, leave me alone. With pleasure. Come on, men. We must get back to the ship. Uh, no, 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 don't go. Oh, by Zeus, I beg you not to leave me here alone, please. What is it? It's, it's my foot. And my poor foot. Come back, strangers, come back. Why do you contradict yourself? Do not blame a man for what he says in the grips of pain. Come with us as we ask you. Never. Not even if Zeus scorches me with lightning. Oh, may the Greeks perish those who rejected this lame foot. The strangers... One last wish. What is it? A sword, an axe, anything you have. What violent act are you planning? I want to cut off all my limbs. Then my head is only killing, killing on my mind. Why? I want to find my father. Where? In Hades. He no longer lives under the sunlight. Dearest city, I would love to see you one last time. I was the one who left your sacred streams to help the Greeks, but now I am nothing. We should have left. A long time ago. Before Odysseus. And Neoptolemus returned. Would someone mind telling me why you are still here? It was my doing, sir. I told them to stay to right the wrong. What did you do that was wrong? I obeyed you and the generals. 
And you think that was a mistake? I defeated a harmless man with lies. What man? I see no man here. What are you plotting against me? Nothing new, but for the son of Poeus. Why am I suddenly afraid of your words? From whom I stole this bow, I... Surely you're not giving it back to him. I was wrong to take it from him. This is no time for joking. Oh, I'm quite serious. How is it right to return the bow I helped you win? It was despicable. I want to make up for what I've done. Clearly you're not afraid of the entire Greek army. Not with justice on my side. You should be afraid. Your threats mean nothing. Not when we stop waging war against the Trojans and turn our attention to you. Whatever you say. Do you see my hand resting on my sword? Do you see mine? Fine. Have it your way. The generals will punish your insubordination. Wisely done. I hope you show the same sense in future. It will keep your feet out of trouble. What is all this shouting for? What do you want from me? Listen to my message without fear. Ah, uh, that is what you said the first time. I have changed my mind. And when you stole my bow? I need to know your decision. Will you stay here and suffer? Or will you sail with us to victory? Ah, uh, don't waste your words. That's your decision? An understatement. I wish you would reconsider. But if I'm not convincing, then I'll stop trying. Well, why would I listen to the boy who stole my means of survival? Why would I do that? You are the shameful son of a noble father. Oh, I hope you die with the rest of the Greeks. Take back your curse and take back your weapon. Oh, you are trying to trick me again. I swear to God I'm not, with Zeus as my witness. Well, those are nice words, if they are indeed true. Judge actions, not words. Give me your hand. Here is your weapon. There. You have the bow. Are you still angry? You have proven once and for all that you are the son of noble Achilles. Greatest among living, greatest among the dead. Thank you for speaking so well of my father and me. Now, hear me out. I have one last question. Each man is required to bear the weight of his own fortune doled out by immortal gods. But when a man insists, as you have, on suffering self-inflicted pain, why should anyone pity him? You have grown savage and will not take advice from any man. You hate those few who have tried to help you, calling them enemies. <laughs> Nevertheless, I will tell you the truth about your disease. I call upon Zeus to witness what I'm about to say. Know this, burn it into your mind. You contracted this infection from a god when you approached the temple of Crisae and stumbled upon the hidden serpent who protects her walls. Know this as well. You will never find a cure for the snake bite until you return with us to Troy and meet with the sons of Asclepius. There, at long last, the, bur the burden of your illness will finally be relieved. And together, with your famous bow, you and I will topple the Trojan Towers. We have a prisoner, Helenus, a powerful seer who foresaw all of these things. He said that Troy will fall this summer and wages his life against his words. Now, now that you know you must agree, return with us to the healing hands, then finish the story. Immortalize yourself at Troy. How can I dismiss his words? And, and how will I endure their eyes, especially the ones who hurt me? I, I want to live in the house of Hades. It is not the past that haunts me but the future, living amongst men. What sort of humiliation will I suffer? I worry for us both. You should not return to Troy, and neither should I. They stripped you of Achilles' arms, and you want to fight by their side? No, it, it is time for us to go home. Forget those evil men. Let them die. You are not like them, and neither am I. You have said many sensible things. Now put your trust in the gods 
and sail away from this island. To the shores of Troy with this wretched foot? Sail to freedom from your illness. Why are you giving such terrible advice? What's best for you is best for me. Aren't you ashamed to say such things? Why should I be ashamed of helping a good friend? Do you mean the generals, or are you speaking of me? You are my only friend. But you are handing me over to enemies. With all due respect, have some humility in your misfortunes. Oh, you are killing me with your words. No, you don't understand. Did you forget the men who abandoned me here? The same men will heal you if you return. Not if I must return to Troy. I give up. You are impossible. It's time for me to stop talking. You can go on living this well, way. Let me suffer what I must suffer. Just make good on your promise, son. Take me home. Stop avoiding it and never mention Troy again. I've heard enough of your words. If that's what you want, then let's go. You have said a noble thing. Walk with me. As best I can. But how will I escape the army? Don't worry about it. What if they invade my country? I'll be there. How will you help? With the arrows of Heracles. What do you mean? I will keep them from your shores. I hope you are right. Say goodbye. Kiss the ground of Lemnos. Not until you hear what I have come to say, son of Poeus. Your eyes recognize the form of Heracles, your ears his voice. I left Mount Olympus to reveal Zeus's desire. Do not sail to Skyros, but obey my command. First, I will remind you of what happened to me, the 12 labors and how I won glorious immortality. You and I share a common destiny. Through suffering, your life, like mine, will achieve greatness. When you accompany this young man to Troy, you will be released from your awful affliction. Then, with my bow, you will bring down Paris, the man for whom the war was fought. You will sack the city of Troy and receive the prize of valor, carrying your spoils to Oeta, the home of your loving father. Then you will burn the plunder on a pyre in reverence to my bow. I offer the same advice to you, son of Achilles, for you are useless without your friend, he without you. Protect each other like a pair of lions. Remember, when you conquer Troy, the gods always demand devotion. You whose voice I long to hear, you who finally have appeared, I will not disobey your commands. I vow to do the same. Do not delay. The moment is now. The wind is right for sailing. I call out to you who kept me company all these years. Farewell to the water nymphs. Farewell to the waves that beat against the cliffs and sprayed my head with salty brine. Farewell to Echo and my rocky home. Farewell, mountain springs and all of Lemnos surrounded by the sea. Give me your blessings for a safe voyage wherever fate is taking me. Let's sail with a prayer to the nymphs of the sea, that we may find our way home. That's the end of our dramatic presentation for this afternoon. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to thank our actors, David Sertharen, Atu Blankson Wood, Chad Coleman, them to come out and take their seats in the audience. Come on out over this way. You can come over and take these chairs right here. And while they're coming out into the audience, I just want to remind our amazing uh, chorus members of the question that I asked them a few seconds ago. It's a question we've asked 560 military audiences over the last 18 years, and now they're going to respond to it just for a few minutes apiece, and we're going to move through a couple of different themes in the fleeting time we have left. Uh, this beautiful afternoon. So the question is simply, you know, this play was written 2,500 years ago by a general named Sophocles. It was performed in a century in which the, the, those watching it saw nearly 80 years of war. The actors would have been combat veterans. There's a theory that the chorus was performed actually by young, adoles late adolescents who were matriculating into the military. The general sat in the front we know that the audience was organized by tribe, which was military unit with the hoplite cadets and the nosebleed section in the back. And here's this 
democracy watching a play toward the end of the experiment of democracy as they're soon to be under siege from all sides um, in which at the center of this play is a story of a service disabled veteran and a caregiver and friend. It's a Greek tragedy with a happy ending. Uh, not so happy for the Trojans, but happy for the Greeks. Um, after Neoptolemus and Philoctetes go to Troy, Philoctetes is healed by the doctor sons of Asclepius. He has to accept help from the very people who betrayed him, the system that betrayed him in order to receive the healing hands of the doctors there. And then he kills Paris, the man who started the war, by abducting Helen. And Neoptolemus kills King Priam, the king of Troy. And through friendship, the war is won. And through the reintegration of a warrior back into his community and into his unit, the Greeks are finally victorious. So the question is simply this. In spite of the distance of culture and time, in spite of everything that separates us from the Greeks who watched and performed and received this play, nearly 2,500 years ago, on this day, commemorating the 10th anniversary of the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial here in Washington, DC, what resonated with you, what spoke to you across time, what touched you, what was true? Now, the chorus members know that, that I was gonna look to who was making the best eye contact to see who would get first, but they're all wearing sunglasses, so it's impossible to tell. Well, except for, yeah, yeah, he does, but maybe, uh, Maybe one brave, intrepid. Uh, yeah, there you go, right over there. Justin. I'll take a, a stab at introducing it. Introducing yourself when yeah. you speak uh, as it pertains to what you have to say. Sure. First, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Chad, David, Addo, and you, Brian, for such a, such a terrific performance along with the other chorus members. I mean, I, it was truly moving. Uh, there were several pro per portions of it that really resonated emotionally within me. Um, once again, my name is Justin Hart. Uh, with an open heart, I would actually like to talk a little bit about myself, but more so about the, the folks that I served with in the military and how it resonates with the story. Um, I served in the 101st Airborne Division, 2nd Brigade, 2nd of the 502nd Infantry Battalion. In 2003, we deployed Iraq for a year in the initial invasion. Uh, during the initial invasion, uh, you know, it's pretty strenuous. Uh, we were moving up in, into Iraq throughout the city of Karbala, and my truck hit uh, what we thought to be an anti-tank mine, essentially. I was manning the 50 caliber machine gun when that happened, and it shot me 15 feet in the air, landed over to the right of it, and I sustained shrapnel wounds uh, along with a broken left fibula, and I was medevaced out. Uh, once I made it back to the rear, I, you know, I did my best on trying to recover as quickly as I could. Uh, and my battalion uh, command sergeant major reached out to me just to check and see how I was doing. So at that time, I was feeling pretty well, and I volunteered myself to go back to, to Iraq. You know, that's pretty significant because I know there's many of us in the audience who would have done the same thing for their fellow comrades, right? Uh, we want to do everything we can and making sure that those people come back and they come back home safe. So after going back, uh, we were out on a night ops mission during the latter part of the deployment, and uh, we were conducting some raids, and uh, there were two UH-60 Blackhawks that collided in with each other. And when they collided, it was pretty devastating. Uh, so with me and my, my platoon, uh, you know, we were the first one to, to provide aid during that. So after that, a couple of months after, we ended up redeploying back to the States, uh, where essentially about a year later in the fall of 2005, uh, we were we redeployed back over to Iraq uh, for another 15 months. On our last deployment, my platoon served as a quick readiness force for our battalion commander and command sergeant major. Most of our time was spent uh, all throughout our battalion and brigade sectors providing any support we could. The area was infamously known amongst our unit as the Triangle of Death. During our last deployment, we lost roughly 67 comrades and close friends and had numerous wounded casualties in combat operations in an area where over 4,200 IDs were found, several being under concrete roads and when exploded, left craters as large as a bus. We also engaged in countless small arms ambushes and mortar attacks. Several IDs were found tragically wherein comrades paid the ultimate sacrifice. We never left any of our fallen behind, ever. During the dry season, we would spend countless hours in 120 degree heat and often be exposed to massive sandstorms, which made it hard to breathe and jammed weapons. The 
rain season wasn't any better as it often resulted in flooded roads or humpies being bogged down in mud or worse. One of our close friends uh, during the rain season, uh, he was manning the 50 caliber machine gun and the driver lost control of the truck and ended up flipping over on top of him. Uh, sadly, he's, he's not with us. As you can imagine, the experiences, pressure, and anxiety were overwhelming, always on the forefront of our minds, including will after service. For us, I can honestly say being there and after returning home, it was like hell on earth. The lie Nia Tomlis shared, uh, for me, I mean, it really stood out really greatly. Um, and that's primarily because when you're in war, for me and, and many of the platoon, many of the uh, other fellow service members I served with, like you would tell each other anything you can to keep the morale going, you know, because you know it was a matter between life and death. Uh, sorry. Kind of hard. So, not only would we tell each other, but we'd also tell our family and friends anything we can to keep our, us in good spirits, even if it meant lying. Saying things like, we're going to be fine, I'm going to do well, we'll make it through this, we'll get them next time, uh, those things were not uncommon. Another lie was, can't wait to get back home to move past all of this. Even that was a lie as the feeling continued even after making it home. The biggest challenge, it, it was truly an uphill battle in trying to live with your emotions. But we never forget, ever. So with the sword to cut off the limbs and the head, right, when, he, when Philoctetes requested the sword to cut off his limbs and head, to me, I mean, that really stood out as well because it reminded me of wanting to escape or be released from that type of environment. When you're over there, like time has a way of slowing down. Uh, essentially, you have a whole bunch of emotions hitting you all at once and you're just trying to do your best to, to make it through the next day, right? Make it through the next mission. Uh, it's almost like being imprisoned in your own mind. You know, I remember coming back from missions and, and walking out of my tent, looking up at the stars late at night, right? And you know, praying to God that, you know, we would all come home safe. You know, unfortunately, those prayers were unanswered. For me, it represented that you would give your own life or be willing to trade your life for another. That stands true even today. If I could turn back the pages of time, I'd go back there and replace myself. You know, I'd be more than happy to give my life for them. The magical bow and arrows, that's a significant part for me. Uh, for me, it symbolized a sense of coming into terms with your experiences. Without it, you have no control over anything, no matter how much you prepare, train, or the unwavering commitment that you have. With it, it symbolizes that the shot that never misses is acceptance uh, through treatment and camaraderie. You know, on that note, you know, I, I got out in 2006, I was stop lost. Right, and uh, I'd just like to recognize a few folks in the audience because they, believe it or not, they mean a lot to me. And so, will my team please stand up and be recognized a little bit? National Service Director Jim Marslick, Deputy National Service Director Chad Mose, Deputy National Service Director for Training Scott Hope, he was here, Assistant National Service Director Scott Trimarkey, Assistant National Service Director Steve Wolf. And although he's new, Matt John, love you, man. So in saying that, that's pretty much all I'd like to share. And thank you again for this, this opportunity. Thank you so much, Justin. I really appreciate everything you said. That's so powerful. Thank you. I think that's what I meant when I said that the Greeks were memorializing their dead, but also creating a memorial or a space that could hold the emotions. That's what a memorial is, right? It's a place that can hold the emotions, a place where it's appropriate to feel them and express them. That's why it's a sacred space. So there's a memorial, and this is beautiful, and then there's a living memorial, which is what you just created in the space. And I feel like by performing as a group together, it generated a space that could hold all those emotions. 
So maybe that's what Sophocles was up to, which is one of the other questions I like to ask audiences. What do you think this general was up to when he wrote and staged this play about this service disabled veteran who was abandoned on an island on account of his own chronic illness for nine years? Um, what was he trying to say? But maybe someone else would like to take on either that question or what resonated with you across time. I promise you don't have to, um, it doesn't have to be long. It could be one line. It could be, yes, Cynthia, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, what resonated with me is, first of all, I did not go to um, Desert Storm or, or Desert Shield. I was in the rear, you know, it was combat casualty. And, and the thing about when you're in, in the Army, you know, you think you don't leave anybody behind. And here, they left someone behind for nine years. And can you imagine the pain that he endured for nine years? And that shows that this individual was strong, stronger than we thought that he could be. But even though he was strong, he still suffered some mental things too. But however, because of, in the end, they said, we're going to get you some help, the help that you need. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things that resonated with mm -hmm. me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It really does run against the grain of contemporary military training mm -hmm. to leave someone behind. And yet, you know, when it comes to invisible wounds, you know, we, we've been talking with military audiences for, for almost two decades now. And I didn't know anyone in the military when we started, but um, we've now met and befriended thousands of uh, veterans and their families. And uh, to a, you know, a person, I've heard some people say, I'll jump on a grenade for you. I'd l put my life on the line for you. But what does it mean to be there for someone who's suffering from something that you can't necessarily see? And, and what does it require of us to live up to that value of never living, leaving someone behind when that disability or that very natural struggle is something that's invisible to most people's eyes? Dan, I think you wanted to speak. Yeah, so I, I mean, what I really got out of it, and I was a, a medic and, and I share the same sentiment on we never leave our wounded behind, and also, uh, just having a mechanism to treat that wound, at least make him comfortable before, do no harm. But I think that what was really resonated for me was that above all, we, we still see Neoptolemus exercising empathy because he went back and forth in conflict with his, his command orders and what he was trying to do. But in the end, his, his ethical heart went ahead and decided to, to go ahead and do the right thing, even if it was outside of what was going to help the cause. I think he, he figured that um, Philoctetes had suffered enough and that he was going to do everything that he could. But again, you can see how Philoctetes lost that trust because there was that conflict that, that constantly was that reminder. And, and I think that, you know, looking at this memorial here reminds us that we have not forgotten. We're not conflicted in our cause. And so it, it is a, a, a continued reminder that we do. And we won't always have a public that is supportive of our veterans, but this is a reminder of that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate, Dan, what you brought into the room. The, the, um, at the center of this play is a theme, betrayal. We now say this word, moral injury soul wounds. It's not even a clinical wound. It's a, something that's spiritual in nature. I saw bad things. I did bad things. Something was done to me. I did something that went against the grain of my moral compass, and now I have to live with that. Philoctetes was betrayed when he was abandoned by his own community, and then he was betrayed again when someone came pre pretending to be his friend and revealing through blind ambition that he was actually following orders in a psychological mission, operation, to deceive him. How does someone rebuild trust when one feels betrayed, whether by one's community or by civilians or by one's government or by people in one's community? How does one accept help and rebuild and face and live the way that Philoctetes did, willing himself to survive for nine years in spite of that betrayal? What is the antidote to the poison? And there are many ways to interpret that snake bite, but the poison of betrayal as it courses through one's veins and body. And the play offers one possible interpretation, which is friendship. 
protect each other like a pair of lions. But for Neoptolemus, he's conflicted. And that's a kind of moral injury, too, to know what's right and then be ordered to do what's wrong. And so here's something kind of amazing, and we're talking about it in Washington, DC. This is a play written by a general about insubordination in front of an audience that would have been all combat veterans. But can a democracy have a conversation about what's right, even while acknowledging the chain of command and the structure of the military or the government? Can we hold spaces of complexity in our democracy that are capacious enough to hold the complexity of what it means to be thrust into ethically complex situations for which there aren't always right answers, and by which people will be haunted for the rest of their lives no matter what they decide to do. There's, there's a, all these Greek plays feature young people thrust into these positions where they have to choose between their career and their life or their empathy for another human being. It's as if the Greeks were saying to young people, this is what characterizes adult life, get ready. Well, where do we do that in our society? And it's something so powerful about hearing veterans talk about that conflict here in this space. Dan, would you like to go? Yeah. I, I felt like uh, they were all kind of complicit in a lie. They were all, like, just by nature of what they're doing, they couldn't trust him. They couldn't trust Philoctetes all the way because they'd betrayed him so badly. Yeah. So, I mean, I it, it made me think of just like how important trust is in, all, in this whole process. And when I was in Iraq and, and it was like, I was put in a position where in media, I was dealing with the media. Yeah. I mean, we were getting, getting people in and it was always, they want to tell this great story and they want to say, well, you know, 99% of the people uh, who make it, uh, make it to the hospital in an hour are going to live. And, and then you, if you dug into the stats a little bit more, the, the, it was kind of a lie because a lot of the people, um, they weren't counting them if they died on the way yeah. once they left. You know, if they, they'd count them if, as a survivor if they just got on a plane, um, but they weren't going back to, uh, you know, they're, they're going back to the States. And then just the idea that you're, you're asked to lie about something that, or, or even just not tell the truth when you're supposed to. Um, and what that costs everyone around you, uh, it's, that was pretty powerful. That is really powerful, and how you can feel complicit in a lie even by omission of the yeah. truth, um, and how your training runs against the grain of that, and yet re life and warfare itself, and the complexity of that, and also being part of a, a media apparatus that's swirling around it. I also want to acknowledge that while what you said is pr I know is true, that those stats are stacked in a certain direction to tell a certain story. It occurred to me when we started to do this work that maybe this play was more relevant now than it was in its own time because through modern medicine, field medicine, combat medicine, I, don't, I know I don't need to tell DAV and its community, but we've created the conditions to save life and sustain life. But we've also created the conditions for many to, to abandon more on islands of chronic illness and sometimes terminal illness. And so I think what the play says now is, you know, what does it mean now that we've had these massive advancements and you know, tens of thousands of people from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan lived that wouldn't have lived in other conflicts had they not been treated so quickly and so efficiently? What does it mean to get them off their islands? I know that's what this organization is about. That's why this is not a memorial for the dead. It's also a call of action for the living which is a really powerful thing, and uh, I feel like for this play. Tony, you look like you wanted to say something, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, well, yeah, yeah uh, something that struck me on this reading was uh, that kind of tender farewell at the end to, to, the, to the island, to Lemnos. You know, the line literally is, farewell to the waves that beat against the cliffs and sprayed my head with salty brine. And that even within that, like that nine years of wretchedness, he, f he was able to, to find some sort of home within, within the physical place and the internal woundedness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, David and I were performing over at uh, Ushis once. This is maybe 15 years ago. And uh, every time we do it, someone comes up and says a line that resonated with them that's different from the time before. Even today, as you guys, that's why it's always fresh because you can't predict how people are going to connect with it. And there's infinite possibilities for how people do. And this young man came up to us, this soldier who had just returned from deployment, and he said, I just want to quote a line from the play that meant something to me. And he took us aside to say it. He said, so you see, I have everything I need here in this cave. Yeah. And then he walked away. 
And I was struck by that, that Philoctetes was resilient and did will himself to survive and developed a relationship with his surroundings. And so he's saying goodbye with great emotion to the, the caves and the nymphs and the water. This was his company. There's a version of this play written by the French playwright André Guide where at the end Philoctetes refuses to go and he stays in his cave with his books and he never goes back to Troy or home again. I think that's not an unlike, you know, that's not necessarily an inappropriate ending either. It's obviously that Sophocles was trying to tell a specific story to his audience near the end of their conflicts and the end of their democracy. But in this instance, you know, I could just as well imagine Philoctetes being self-sufficient uh, with the, the community he's built in isolation on Lemnos and how hard it is to leave that behind. Um, we've done a lot of performances at VAs and also in homeless shelter facilities for veterans throughout the country, but especially in New York. One of the lines that we've heard often over and over again, veterans who are experiencing homelessness say, resonated with them was when Philoctetes, who's now contemplating leaving behind the island, which he's so familiar with now, it's his home, saying, it's not the past that haunts me, but the future, living amongst men. And it's sort of a paradoxical idea of being haunted by the future. But again, I think the complexity of that at a memorial that both recognizes the past, but also acknowledges those who are living with um, conditions and, and that they must overcome and struggle and, and uh, that that's the sacrifice they've made. That, that's part of it. What does it mean not only to accept help, but also to live with the consequences of service in a world that doesn't necessarily understand what service is? Just, um, Justin was yeah. talking about, uh, he was talking about the service department, what we do to help veterans with benefits. And, and that, that Philoctetes thing remind me of what you'd hear from the, the guys who were doing homeless outreach out of Vietnam, they didn't know if, if some veterans probably had brain injuries that were misdiagnosed or undiagnosed, and they would go and here, even here in Washington, D.C., and find a veteran who had literally set up a perimeter. They were homeless, but they'd set up a perimeter around them and they were living like that. Or the people who disappeared into the bush in Alaska or, or just went out on their own and self-isolated just to get and and then and then you hear that you hear that well if I have my guns and my dog I'm going to be fine I'm I'm going to do this and then you wonder what's the quality of life yeah well yeah you know, and I didn't mean to fetishize that part of it because obviously I believe that the healing that takes place for Philoctetes the majority of the healing before he even sees the doctors is learning to trust again and feeling like he's part of a community again I want to ask you all a second question well maybe and you can ignore it you can ask your own question you can fuse all of your answers into one perfect statement I don't really care but I want to ask you about the screams at the center of the play so in the Greek play the original text there is more screaming more wailing more calling out for mercy than in my translation that was performed here today why do you think Sophocles would gather 17,000 citizen soldiers in the center of Athens and have a combat veteran playing Philoctetes screaming the way that you heard Philoctetes screaming? It was because the guys couldn't do it themselves. They, they, didn't, they, weren't, um, they weren't grieving themselves, probably. In one way, it sounds like you may be giving permission for people to begin breathe. Uh, grieving. The, the, the Greeks knew, just like this memorial, there had to be a place there had to be a time where those emotions could be expressed. So someone's gonna start the screaming, if, that, if I hear you. I but think the yeah. screaming resonated with me. I think also um, <clears throat> when he, <clears throat> excuse me, when he said, you know, chop off my leg, uh, I want it gone. I think, you know, in our healing, I've, I've felt like that many times, both physically and mentally. Physically, you know, I wanna chop off whatever body part hurts so bad, just, just take it off. I want it to be gone, I don't care. Um, and also even mentally, you know, um, unfortunately that's, uh, you know, what, what comes with uh, suicidal ideation sometimes. It's, you know, I just want to end the pain. I just, however I have to do it, I just want to end it. Um, and I, you know, I, I think I, I truly can resonate um, with, with that part of him and the wailing and the, just, just I want it gone. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I appreciate that. There's something in the scream and the wailing and the calling out for the end to the pain 
that many have resonated with. You know, but sometimes we perform this play in a setting where people have experienced a great deal of physical or emotional trauma, and I look out in the audience, and everyone's smiling during the screening. <laughs> And it took me back the first time it happened. And so I just asked in a uh, Borden Avenue veterans residence in New York City, uh, why is everyone smiling? And they said, because I feel seen. Or because I know that screen. Um, because that touches some re base reality that I know that, that is being ignored at some level. Anyone else have any interpretations of the length, the duration of the screens going on for that? Well, I, I have the interpretation that I think that Philoctetes, this is when he started to begin his trust with Neo, Neo, Neptotolemus, and he felt like it wasn't going to be another time where, okay, he is so bad off, we're not going to take him, we're going to leave him. So his comfort level to be able to just let go, it's like having to trust in talking to somebody a, a, about anything, you know, like a, a caregiver. And, and so I, I feel like that not only showed that Philoctetes trusted Neptolemus, but he also felt like he could just go ahead and let go and he would be there with him. So he showed him something. He, 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 he lifted back the veil and showed him something about his hidden pain that he hadn't shown anyone else. He showed it to another, if not veteran, a service member. And he hoped that that person would accept him and still be there after he w went unconscious. But then he, when he woke up and he saw him there, he was overwhelmed because no one had ever been there after he had gone unconscious all these years. Um, I see that you are noble, he says, like your father. Um, I think that's totally it. He, he, he made himself but vulnerable and shared something with, with Neoptolemus. And that created a bond that made it impossible for Neoptolemus to ultimately betray him or betray himself. So being vulnerable and accepting help is a, is, creates a kind of virtuous cycle of service. It can move in both directions. I think that's really important. Um, I, I've had people stand up and interpret this question about the screams lots of different ways. And um, one, of, one of the ways that I often talk about is um, you know, uh, the, the challenge of hearing the screams. Um, Neoptolemus has a line, your pain is painful to observe. And I feel like so much of this play is about not looking away. Um, Odysseus says, don't look at him or you'll taint our fortune or our future. And Philoctetes says, he won't even look at me. He won't even look in my direction after he sort of so what does it mean to look in the direction of service disabled veterans? Not with pity, but to, to take in the full complexity and, and the importance of seeing and not marginalizing. And why is it important for there to be a memorial here that stands the test of time that does that and maybe helps others, create, creates the permission for others to see and hear, not just the screams, but also the triumphs. Um, and not look away, yeah. You know, I think the, when it comes to the screams of agony, it's, it's screams for help um, and camaraderie, because that's what was lacking at the time. Um, and when Heracles pointed out, protect each other like a pair of lions, it's exactly what our organization does. It's veterans helping veterans and giving back and uh, bringing back that camaraderie that we once had when we were in the service. Um, and I mean, Justin said it earlier that when, when we're deployed, we depend on one another. Um, time kind of slows down when you're when you're outside the wire, but when you're home, or not home, sorry, when you're back in the in the choose with everybody else downrange, that's what helps the time pass by is remembering the good times and not necessarily um, lying to one another, but just taking care of each other um, and being there for them when they come home. And ultimately, that's what what's lacking is the camaraderie. Um, and this memorial is a testament to it. Our organization is a testament to it that, you know, just because we're home doesn't mean that the suffering is ended. And we need to make sure that we need to go out and find those individuals who are hurting but too prideful to ask for help or may just may not know about things. Yeah, well, I mean, what does it mean to help veterans to get off islands and back into the company of friends and the community? What will it take, um, especially those who may have felt betrayed along the way or at least compromised by the, the complexity of what war is. I want to ask you one last question. It's just about the ending. Uh, scholars call it a problem play. 
I, I don't think any m military veteran or spouse has ever had a problem understanding the play, but scholars seem to have a problem with it because Heracles, the god, comes in at the end. This was done by a, a, a crane called the deus ex machina, the god from the machine, where the actor playing the god would have been swung in and he would have said those final lines. But I just want to remind you that like, the right before that occurs, um, Neoptolemus agrees to take Philoctetes home. He says, fine. If that's what you want, then let's go. And then the god shows up. And he says, not until you hear what I have to say, all the things we've talked about, your, your lives will achieve greatness through suffering and through friendship, the war will be won. Protect each other like a pair of lions. And then Philoctetes finally leaves the island in the last moments of the play. What do you make of the ending? Does it speak to your experience in the contemporary world of this memorial? Is it a problem? Is it a problematic ending? Um, what do you think? Yeah, Nancy. One thing that struck me during this play is how Neoptolemus, Neoptolemus had to struggle with the moral question of whether to tell the lie, and he did. But then as he got to know Philoctetes and see his pain and, and all of that, he saw himself. He's new to war. So maybe he sees himself in the future here, and he would want someone to be sympathetic to his pain as well. And agreeing to take uh, Philoctetes back was the ultimate move of care and, and taking care of others. Even though you are injured, and Philoctetes told him earlier in the play, what have you done to him? You've ruined him for life. So he's going to have to live with that pain. And Neoptolemus saw Philoctetes and his pain that he endured for nine long years. So that's, I like to think that he saw himself there and wanted to take wow. him home. Five, 565 performances in, no one has made that connection. I, I really, this idea that if I understand it correctly, that Neoptolemus has sustained a moral injury. Yes. He is service disabled. He mm -hmm. ha is now living with the consequences of having been ordered to do something that goes against the grain of his moral compass, and he's conflicted. And Philoctetes' line is, look at his face. His face says it all. He hates himself for what you made him do. It's you who taught him how to lie, you who ruined him forever. Yes. And that it is until Neoptolemus is actually injured with his soul wound that it's his way in. It's his way of understanding that he has a, an obligation as a caregiver. Yes. And it's, his, it's, Neop, it's completely symmetrically, Neoptolemus' path to healing, yes. to care for another veteran, protect each other like a pair of lions. And what gets me so excited as a civilian who just gets to be part of this sacred stuff is I see veterans all the time telling their stories and then in the process of telling their stories, realizing that they're helping other veterans in the room and being healed by the fact that they're helping others. And that virtuous cycle of service, no matter what you believe in uh, or don't believe in, is so real. And I think it's what this monument, this memorial also is, also is a testament to. Does anyone else have anything to say about the ending or maybe something burning within you that wasn't addressed by one of my extremely leading questions? <laughs> I promise you won't be kept called the person, branded the person who kept us in the blazing sun. That's me uh, for all this time, just for a couple of minutes. Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, so um, just mostly just keep going back to how betrayal and rejection led to the contradiction of uh, Philoctetes. Is he cried for help for nine years from mostly seeking it from his peers and was continually rejected. Yeah, now. Very similar to you know, folks who have cons continually sought out help and been rejected, and the only way to get them help is from those who were the perpetrators. And I see, like, um, Neoptolemus is almost like the veteran's advocate, the role we play, is they're the one that needs to shepherd it and lead the conversation of, like, us getting folks reconnected with the VA. The government was the one who put us in these situations that, uh, you know, led to you know, these circumstances, and then we're also the only ones that are gonna help us heal are both the peers that help us lead us back to the government, which is the resources that will get us to heal. And so the contradiction is he kept seeking help, getting rejected, but it was that one individual 
that didn't wasn't the seasoned veteran. He was the brand new, inexperienced, but he had some thread of commonality, and his empathy was the thing that connected him, that got him to become vulnerable, to regain that trust, and finally seek help. And that's so reflective in the work that we do is that you got to continually engage with folks no matter how much, how often, or how long to get them to where they actually need to be and live successful, uh, sustainable lives. Thank you so much. That's such a beautiful way to tie it back to DAP and your, your work. Anyone else have a burning last word to offer? No? We can go to Shady now. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, the minute I say that, the cloud comes over, and uh, we can sit here for another three and a half hours. We won't. Um, I just want to say, first of all, I want to give a huge round of applause to our uh, chorus of DAV veterans. Thank you so much for everything that you've offered. Um, it's no small thing to act in a Greek tragedy with minimal rehearsal. Uh, and then followed up by making such personal connections to your own service experience and your own experience as advocates and being vulnerable and present with your own stories and thoughts. That seems that the memorial and the play both call for that, and I feel like you've lived up to and exceeded all that's been called for today. I'm just grateful for that. Um, if we had one message to deliver on this uh, momentous 10th anniversary to those gathered here and those gathered on Zoom who've been watching us all over the world, we've had some recent events with as many as 87 countries tuning in. Mm -hmm. So this is not a, just a hyper-local conversation in D.C. This is a global conversation that's framed by this memorial and the veterans who participated. It's simply this. If you related to anything that was said over the last hour and 45 minutes on stage or uh, in, in the space, you're not alone here at the memorial and around the world. You're not alone across the country. This marks the end of the 560-something uh, performance, the Theater of War. I hope there are at least 500 more and that maybe you get to be part of them and that our chorus grows in its ranks. Most critically, you are not alone across time. If that's all you heard, that's the public health message of ancient Greek tragedy, that the struggles depicted in this 2,500-year-old play are as old as humanity itself, or at least what we know of humanity from written records from 2,500 years ago. And that can provide solace. I've seen lots of veterans and other populations find solace in learning that they weren't the only ones who felt or experienced these complex things. It could also be disturbing because so little has changed over all that time. After an early performance at Theater of War, a female, a woman general stood up and she answered the question I often ask audiences. The question is, why do you think Sophocles wrote the play? And she said, I think Sophocles wrote the play because he's, he was in the minority with regard to the compassion he felt for the individuals portrayed in the play, in his community. I think Sophocles wrote the play to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And we hope we did a little of both for everyone here, aside from the sun afflicting you. I hope that we did a little of both for everyone here today. Comfort that we can come together across thousands of years, across states and geography, across countries and the world, through a story and a shared narrative, um, and through a chorus of veterans who model a variety of perspectives and experiences. Comforted that we can make connections uh, in a space as sacred as this one and connect not just with the past, but with the present and the future, and afflicted by the reality that there is so much more work to still be done to address the screams of Philoctetes and the moral suffering of Neoptolemus and individuals to our left and our right almost at all times, though we can't hear those screams. And it's with that sense of affliction, but also, I hope, action that we leave you uh, with the hope that it leads to more conversations, to more dialogue, to more healing, to more complexity and conversation. Um, it's been an absolute honor being with you all here this afternoon. I want to thank our actors and our uh, chorus and DAV and the tech team and Marjolaine Goldsmith from my team for making today possible to Rob uh, Lewis and Victoria Short for all of they, what they did to shepherd us through. And I think, Dennis, um, I'm going to turn things over to you for closing remarks. As Dennis comes up, I just want to say it's been an absolute honor and pleasure and privileged to be with you. Our next uh, performance uh, is uh, at Kenyon College in the uh, middle of Ohio, where we'll be performing a version of Theater of War that will be exploring the impact of war on civilians and children from the perspective not just of veterans, but from countries that have been affected by war all over the world. We try to move it in all directions with our work. 
We hope you'll come to the next performance that you can, either on Zoom or in person, and that we'll see you and hear from you again soon. Dennis, over to you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, before I do the closing ceremonies, it's going to be brief, quick, you know, post or uh, remove the flags. Uh, I just want to say that at the end, on the way out, there is water. Uh, I don't know that anybody would like a bottle of water, but it's there in case you need it. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, thank you all for being here. You know, Brian, what a moving presentation. Thank you to our friends at Theater of War and to our chorus members for their vulnerability in sharing. And thank you all for joining us uh, here today to uh, celebrate the 10th anniversary of the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial. Your presence honors the sacrifices of our brave veterans and underscores our commitment to their legacy. Together, let us continue to advocate for their rights and ensure their stories are never forgotten. To conclude the ceremonies, I'll ask the DAV Department of the District of Columbia Color Guard to please retrieve the colors. If everyone would please rise. Thank you. Let's give them a final round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our anniversary celebration. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>